this fast spent on the scaling. And I will deal with this topic today on Wednesday. And what we are talking about scaling will be the influence of size on the behavior of a structure. Either making it very large or very small has an influence on how that object interacts with the environment. So, uh, who knows this legend? The guy on the ground there is who? Oliver Trevor. Gulliver, right? And so, we don't in a while here calculate if he's 12 times larger than the small people in the town he finds, uh, how much will they have to feed him? 12 times more than the regular people? Or how many times? 12 times, you will see. So that's going to be scary. So what we're going to cover is first uh, an introduction and definition of what is scaling involves. And then we we'll talk a little bit about this concept of micro-intuition. It means, can you actually predict from your mind uh, how a small object in the nanodomain or micro-domain will actually interact with the environment? Or should you use mathematics? And you will see actually your intuition is often misleading. Sometimes you'll have it right, but most of the time you'll be wrong. So it's probably better to introduce some math to predict how uh, scaling influences behavior. Uh, then we're going to talk about surface to volume effects. That is, uh, if you make something very small, as you know, the surface to volume becomes much larger, and that has a lot of consequences. And we'll talk about fractal dimensions and Kleiber's law. It might well be that for this class uh, I will leave out fractal dimensions uh, and just do surface to volume effects and Kleiber's law. And fractal dimensions I will let you read up on uh, in the book. We then talk about the importance of fractals and layers ah, in electrochemistry, your favorite subject. Uh, you're going to try to figure out why would it be a good idea to make an electrode not flat and planar, but make it in the shape of a little tree. Why would that be good? Uh, then one of the mathematical equations or expressions we will use uh, to understand scaling is called Trimmer's vertical bracket notation. Trimmer is a well-known MEMS researcher in the United States who introduced this idea of vertical bracket notation. Then we do some scaling examples, and finally we are looking at deviations of linear scaling, and that will be uh, by Wednesday. I think Trimmer's vertical bracket notation, that will also be for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So we can probably cover the first four bullets today, and the rest we do on Wednesday. Uh, the cartoon there on the right is uh, showing uh, what happens uh, today in nanotechnology. It's possible to make the same structure with top-down or with bottom-up methodology. We talked about that, right? But what's the difference between top-down and bottom-up manufacturing? Uh, start with uh, bottom-up manufacturing. How does that work again? Hmm? To the big one, right? You, you build up from very small building blocks to the larger ones. Whereas in the more traditional manufacturing method that uh, people have been using for centuries, it's the opposite, right? We start from a big thing and make it smaller and smaller. Now, the last 20 years or so, we can often make an object either way, building from the small to the larger uh, or uh, from the large to the small one, which is kind of interesting. You have an option now. Mechanical and electrical engineers often will do it top down. Right? But chemical engineers and molecular biologists, they will tend to work from the small to the large. But in both cases, what this class is really about is, if you make something very small, does it behave the same as the large thing? Uh, suppose I make a, a mini-me. Uh, we see the movie, mini-me, make a very small me or a very small you. Right? Will that you act the same way? Will it eat as much? Will it drink as much? Huh? Will it party as much? All these things. We want to see how the scaling of these things work. So, introduction and definition. Uh, 
this is actually a little bit of a, a defense of why we do micro and nanotechnology. This is a very generic slide, and in your career, you often will have the right proposals, right, and for the government or for a company, and you have to defend why do you do nanotechnology. And in a way, this table here, on this slide and the next one, it explains why we want to miniaturize things. And usually, we will actually find for some reason miniaturization is good. But actually, sometimes it's bad. And so the first thing for you all to get is when is miniaturization good, when is miniaturization bad. So let's go over a couple of points. Uh, we all know that uh, with the tremendous population growth on Earth, uh, we are encroaching the limits of our planet's resources. And the continuing deterioration of the environment that goes with that, the all added urgency to the trend towards miniaturization. And if you think about it, this happens in electronics, in optics, in magnetics. It's like the whole world has recognized we have to be careful not destroy our environment. We should not make so much impact. And so that is one reason why miniaturization is so important. Mind you, it's easier said than done. Many of my friends are saying, you know, to make something very small, it might take much more energy than make something relatively large. It's not necessarily so that miniaturization is environmental friendly. No? You really have to think about that. Uh, so in the table on the right, you list sound reasons for miniaturization systems of actuators, power sources, sensors, and components. So what are some of the benefits? Well, if you make something small, you can make it redundant. You know, you could say you have a sensor that breaks, you yeah, don't care, I have another one, another one. So you make it redundant. You can make an array. Uh, Redundancy and arrays is not necessarily the same. Eh? Redundancy might mean identical ones. First one breaks and take the second one, and so on. An array might be different small sensors uh, that you use to measure something. For example, arrays are used in so-called electronic noses and electronic tongues. Through scaling, we will actually see that small things typically are faster. And this is already one of these things you can kind of get an intuition for, isn't it? An elephant is big and slow, right? But a chipmunk is very fast. So small things are typically faster, right? higher frequency, etc. So there you can already see her. But why is that, right? We eventually need to mathematically describe that. Why is a small thing faster? A very important one here. We will often find that if you make something small, it requires less power. So that's another reason why you miniaturize things. But you will find that some gas alarms, I don't know where are the gas alarms here. Is that one? Fire alarm. They used to require maybe three watts. Nowadays, with micro machining, we can make them at 30 milliwatts meaning we might be able to use a battery instead of mains. So again, lower power budget, so scaling, making something smaller, faster, lower power budget. These are all good things, right? Why the dynamic range? What well, it means is often with a small item, you can cover a bigger range, maybe let's say pressure. You want to measure in a bigger dynamic range. With MEMS, my machine, you can do that. And often you can actually do it because you can make an array, right? You could make, let's say, pressure sensor from 0 to 10 Pascal, from 10 Pascal to 100, etc. right? So you could cover a wide dynamic range, which would be more difficult if you do it with big, expensive devices. Increase sensitivity and selectivity. So you remember the difference between the two, right? Sensitivity, selectivity. So selectivity is distinguishing between different entities, right? And sensitivity, uh, note of caution. Sensitivity and lower limit of detection. There's a difference there, right? Do you remember what the difference is? 
sensitivity is a slope, right? And lower limit of detection is what again? Do you remember that? A lower limit of detection, LOD, is the smallest amount of something you can reliably detect. So, again, we will see that through miniaturization, you can have best selectivity and sensitivity. We have to understand why, right? What's behind that? And that's what scaling is about. It's understanding what do you buy by making something small. And look at all of these good things so far. And by the way, it will not remain that good. The world is not like that, right? There's always a penalty. We will see there's some bad things also. So, minimizing the energy and the cues used in manufacturing, you hope so, but as I told you, that's not always evident. That's not always true. Often it becomes easier to integrate a small thing with electronics. Sometimes you can have on a piece of silicon the electronics here and the sensor next to it. So you can integrate it. This is going to be, become a very, very important point, which I will cover on Wednesday only. That is, I wonder if you understand the sentence. Exploitation of new effects through the breakdown of continuum theory. That's a complicated sentence, right? You see, when we study physics, we typically say boundary conditions, right? We say, okay, I'm going to assume my electrode, uh, chemistry, is large compared to the diffusion wave thickness. Uh, that's a boundary condition. But in the micro and nano domain, that might not be true. I might have a working electrode that's small compared to the diffusion wave thickness. And then I have breakdown of continuum theory. And that's actually where men's and nanotechnology becomes especially of interest. Right? Because if you have linear scaling, you just make it 10 times smaller, but the effect is 10 times smaller. So what? The really interesting aspects of nanotechnology and MEMS happen when you have a breakdown of continuum theory. Because something unexpected will happen. And on Wednesday, you will see two or three examples of that. When you have a breakdown of continuum theory, Cost performance advantage, your manager will always like that, right? If he's if you're making money for the department, you have to put this one first, right? If you're a scientist, you put this one first. Right? Improved reproducibility, right? Because we make small devices often in batches. We make 10,000 of them all at the same time. And if you do, do that, sensor one, sensor two, sensor three, they're all much more similar. And that's a benefit, right? You can predict or get a visibility because of the batch uh, behavior. So these are all good, sound reasons for miniaturization. Before going to the next slide, could you, on your own, come up with a couple of examples where miniaturization is bad? Where by making something small, you lose utility. Can you think of some? So instead of, this is all good, right? Very positive. But so, you make something small, and yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. It doesn't help me. Any examples? Very simple one. Battery. If you make a battery very, very small, it will not last very long, will it? Right? So that's an example. We will actually see that if you go in the micro domain, all the forces become very important. For example, roughness of a surface, friction, becomes very, very, very important. Yeah? And so, you have to fight other forces in the micro domain than in the macro domain. Let me see a couple of examples of that. So, in this class, we analyze scaling laws in the micro and nano domain and check the size regimes where macro theory start requiring corrections. That is, this non-continuum corrections here. This uh, third bullet from the bottom. So, there's actually more reasons here why miniaturization improved accuracy and reliability. That has to do with this batch fabrication, right? Because they're also similar, they're almost identical. Uh, this is another obvious one here. If you want to make a minimal invasive sensor, you want to make it very small, right? And actually, they have two, you see here, a 
for me is very important because my very first men's project when I was a young man going from Belgium to Stanford Research Institute in uh, Menlo Park in California, my first project was for a German company to try to make an artificial mosquito, to try to sample blood so people would not feel any pain. Uh, and so we called it the artificial mosquito because we were micro machines trying to micro machine a proboscis of a mosquito. The proboscis of a mosquito is 75 microns, 75 microns. And when it goes into your skin, you might say, but it hurts. It does not hurt because of the prick. It hurts because of the swelling of the chemical. So if you actually could make such a needle, you might be able to sample blood for a diabetic patient that would be painless. So you could make minimal invasive uh, devices and see mosquito project. But you know what? When you do do that, uh, so it's easy enough actually to make 75 microns is actually large nowadays, right? If you make such a needle, most of the time you don't get any blood. You know why that is? Because the microcapillaries are further apart, so you might miss it. Hmm? And you say, oh, what does this mosquito do that? Mosquito always gets blood, right? Finds it. You know how? Yeah, they find it. They go and then it's sideways. So that's difficult to micro machine, right? So nature is always a little bit smarter than us. How people solve it now, there's a group in Berkeley, one at Georgia Tech. Uh, that have solved this problem. They make an array. They make many needles. So one with it, right? So uh, they make an array of, let's say, 10 by 10 or so. That, that's a possible answer. But again, you see here that uh, minimalization here is, is a requirement. But there's a final one, and this is a little bit philosophical. Uh, maybe mankind, we have no choice. Uh, to survive as a human species, we might have to be more and more inventive. And uh, maybe we should talk about that over here, because this will become very philosophical. So I will need a little bit of time to explain this point here. It's based on the, the law of accelerating returns. So I'll go there in a moment. But before switching to the next slide, so the list of factors here, all these positive things do not always apply. Scaling might favor smaller devices, we said faster, less power, but it also might disfavor miniaturization. For example, smaller power sources, right, like batteries. Uh, they might last less long. And also, when you make a small actuator, that's something that needs to exert a force. If it's smaller, it will exert less force. So, you should not overly promise that this will solve all the problems of the world, they will not. Yeah? Uh, having said that, let's now talk about this kind of odd statement here. Do we have a choice? You might say you always have a choice, right? That's right. There's this man, uh, Ray Kurzweil. I would like you to buy this book. And you should read this book. It's called The Age of the Spiritual Machines. Has anyone ever heard about this? Ray Kurzweil in the United States, very famous person. He's a <coughs> futurist. Uh, you can look on his website. He has his own website where he's predicting the future. You know, he has made these predictions. At what point will computers be more powerful than a human brain? Uh, he has many, many inventions to his name. He's still quite a character, perhaps a little bit too optimistic. Uh, uh, he thinks he will live 2,000 years or something like that. He has some pretty far out ideas. But if you enjoy thinking about the future, he's a good uh, author to read. He has many more books. Uh, this is one of his older ones. Uh, but you might start with this one. You see, what he's basically saying is this. Now, uh, put on your philosophy hat. You have a hat? Put on the philosophy hat. How would the philosophy hat look like that? That maybe right? <laughs> the diamond huh? and with the little what do you call it? Trestle, right? Trestle. So uh, 
let's start like this. You probably have seen on television, maybe National Geographic, <coughs> there's a, a monkey and there's a, a hill with ants in it. And the monkey likes to eat ants. So the monkey takes a stick and it makes it a little bit wet and puts it in the hill and then it eats the ants. Right? Next generation, monkey does the same. 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 So the learning curve in that case is like an S-curve. It goes up and then flat. What Kutzwal is saying, uh, humans are different. Humans, the learning keeps on going up exponential. And it goes faster and faster. And he said, what is that? <coughs> and he says, it's because we can write things down. You can read it in a book. And so, you will become smarter than me. Your children will be smarter than you. They will learn faster and faster. Because they will have better means to read information. They will have better means to make fast progress. That's very optimistic, right? That's such a positive view. And you know what he says even more? I find that so interesting. He said biology has always done that. You see, the information in biology and how you are made is stored where? In your DNA, right? And over time, the DNA has adapted to the environment. Now comes this point here, we have no choice to become better and better at technology. Why? See, look at how many of you have glasses on. How many people might not even be here if medicine didn't exist? In other words, we have become so weak, we cannot wait for our DNA to save us. Only our technology can save us. So, because we are so far removed from the jungle, from nature, we can only be saved by inventing faster and faster and faster. Because we have in a way become weaker and weaker and further and further removed of things that control our DNA to create the next best human. We don't want to wait, right? We want to be the best human, right? So we can only do it here and by writing it down. So in a way, our books, uh, that's funny, right? In the West, I always say Gutenberg, who invented the printing press, and in Korea, I say, no, not Gutenberg. They say Koreans did it, right? What does it call? The printing Koreana, the, the wood blocks for printing. What are they called? Uh, it's one of the. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them, but you cannot do it. No. The letters. Wood block, yes. What is it called? Anyways, in Korea they also say, oh, we invented, not the European. Like something like Tripicana, Tripicana. Tripicana. Yeah, that is it. Say it loud. Tripicana. Tripicana. How many people knew this? So 200 years before Gutenberg, Gutenberg in Germany, maybe in the 15th century, I think. Maybe 16th century, probably like 1556 or something like that. 16th century. And so supposedly in Korea they were ahead. And so anyways, that was the beginning, right? Maybe not the beginning. The beginning was uh, painting in caves. Also here in Ulsa, we have the petroglyphs, chuk, 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 chuk. information, right? You said Tipitaka is the original word for what? For uh, printing, printing, application and distribution of print. Right? Printing? Yeah, because with these wood blocks, they could replicate a document very fast. Before that, only few people could read. Right, because it was too expensive. But once you can replicate it, 
the whole population can become smarter. Anyways, that's kind of this point that Ray Kurzweil is making. So let's read this together, and with my story I told you, see if you understand. Evolution, which you could say is more and more sophistication, right? In evolution you grow to a more and more sophisticated life form. Of life forms, or technology speeds up because you're built on their own recorded degree of order. Do you understand that now? Right? Technology, it advances because it's built on its recorded history of the technique in books, in memory disks, etc. <coughs> in uh, biology, the thing is the DNA. Right? So, they're built on their own recorded degree of order. And so, Ray Kurzweil, he calls this the law of accelerating returns. So, instead of that S curve, have an exponential goes faster and faster. Right? Because it's not like you have to learn everything that I've learned. You learn a lot more because so much more is discovered. So you go faster and faster. Uh, a very nice example of that all of you have heard about is Moore's Law. Who, who remembers what Moore's Law is? M-O-O-R-E, Moore's Law. What was that? Gordon Moore. You heard about that? Exactly, right? It's about how fast I see chips develop. And Moore's law said that every 18 months or so, it has changed a little bit over time. The amount of I see chips you can cram in one centimeter square has doubled. That's an example of this accelerating return. But what the Kuzma is saying, that's not only true for uh, chips, it's true for optics, magnetics, anything that has been recorded, and you don't have to start from scratch, you get faster and faster returns, accelerating returns, where humans have taken over from their DNA, in a way, and they have to secure their own safety to developing better and better technology, or they have no choice. So this law of accelerating returns gave us ever greater order in technology, which led to computation. Computation is, of course, the essence uh, of order. And so Kurzweil extended Moore's law to all computation and applies it to all human technologies. And at a point for life forms, DNA provides the record. In the case of technology, is the ever-improving methods to record information. And so every time we get better at storing more information, nowadays we call uh, what we call them the memory sticks. Think how much in advance that is in a way. If you want to, I want to give you my PhD thesis. Oh, here, here's my book. <laughs> it's on such a teeny amount of information. This has so much consequences culturally, uh, actually for all of mankind, uh, in terms of faster uh, transmission of information and therefore being able to faster develop new technology. So, if you're interested in this kind of philosophy, obviously I cannot ask a question in the final midterm on this. This is more for your curiosity, to satisfy your curiosity, to know the philosophy of this innovation uh, trend. I'm going too slow again, but that's okay, right? Because I told you, you can relax today and. Uh, Wednesday, you make it a little bit more fun and kind of hopefully very interesting. No math, little math, but more <laughs> concepts. So, still about uh, this definition and introduction to scaling laws. You've seen these things, right? These Russian insect dolls. You can see if I go from the large to the small one, they all retain their aspect ratio. That is called isometric scaling. And that's what we're talking about. When I make a structure, and I want to look at what happens when I make it small, I need to scale it isometrically. Right? I cannot make it very different. Let's say I cannot make it very fat when it's small. It needs to have the same aspect ratio. So scaling laws deal with the structural and functional consequences of changes in size or scale among otherwise similar 
called isometric structures or organisms. And so these are isometric structures. And I want to know, for example, if I heat this doll or I heat this one, which one will heat faster? How much faster? Which one will cool faster? Which one will break first? All these things. That is scaling loss. And first, we're going to do in an intuitive manner, we're going to kind of say, oh, I guess this one will break first. Oh, this one will heat faster, etc. But then, we will see actually if you do it that way, you're often wrong. And so we will start putting some math in it, and some more logical approach to it. Now, when I go from this inset doll to this one, there's basically three things I can play with. That's, of course, I can change, for example, the thickness of the wall. For example, let's say this one doesn't break, but this one becomes too floppy. So I make the wall a little bit thicker. So it, it can be stronger, it doesn't fall apart. I could change the materials, right? I could go from brick to steel. And finally, I could also change the design. I could go, for, for example, from compression to tension elements. And let's say big bridge versus small bridge. I could change the structural design. So that's not the three parameters. We can choose to adapt what happens when I scale something up or down. So now comes this uh, Gulliver, right? But actually, it's not only Gulliver. If you think about it as small children, you're always very interested in something that's either very small or something that's very large. Probably because you're so small, you have to look up, right? You see your father's legs, the table looks so high. And so in your mind, that's an important thing, scale. That's probably why, if you look at the literature, right, from famous books, Tom Tum, uh, by the Brothers Grimm, what happens when you're very small, and then what happens when you're very uh, tall. So, as children already, we learn to deal with everyday objects having size and scale dimension that are naturally sized up by our sensing, and we are mystified and really enthralled by much larger or much smaller things. So, and this is something where you will very quickly get at a loss. It is much more difficult to get a feel for or understand the consequences uh, of dimensional changes that go beyond size. If you're talking about, oh, this is this size or this size, it's easy to recognize, right? But if you say, what is the consequence for how much do you need to eat, for example, if you're 12 times larger or 12 times smaller, it becomes much more difficult to use your intuition only. That is because our mind thinks linearly. It's easy for us to think about sizes. It's much more difficult to think about forces. And of course, that's what we're interested in. We want to know how do the forces interact with Tom Tom or Gulliver? How are they changing as a function of scale? So, well, and I'm going to give you an example of that in a moment. Does someone have a beaker with water? I need a beaker. Uh, yeah, there's a beaker there. Is that no? That drink there. There's a drink there, right? Can you bring that drink to one next to you? Is there something in there? No, nothing in there? No. There's something in there, right? Ah, here. Ah, here. So, So, <laughs> so this is filled with whatever it is. Yeah? Your work. And, and if I do like this, oh. what will happen? What are the forces? There's a volume in there, right? There's a liquid in there. Yes. And it's attracted by gravity to his head. Right? So how does that scale? It's volume, right? And that scales as L to the third, right? Now, I put the same amount of liquid in this. Same amount, but now 
is very narrow, right? And I do like this, and it doesn't come out. Why is that? Another force has come in here. What force? Here, gravity. Scales as the volume L to the third. Here, surface tension. Yes. Scales as surface tension scales as L to the one radius. Very important law. Tell you now. In the microdomain, those forces scaling with a lower power become dominant. I'll say it again. We compare these two forces, right? Gravity, surface tension. In the microdomain, this one dominates this one. So the force with the lower power becomes more important. Let's write this down. This is the first mathematical insight you're getting. When they make something small, all the forces start controlling. Okay? For example, surface tension becomes very important. By the way, insects have a marvelous time at that. They love this because insects live in that small world. And the forces that control them are very different. The forces that control us to your big, right? Or gravitation. In the case of insects, it's diffusion, it's surface tension. That's why an insect can walk on water. We cannot, right? So an insect, in a way, is happier, is better accommodated than us. It works with all the forces. Of course, then, an insect can get stuck because if there's maybe some honey here, it's so viscous, it gets trapped with its feet and cannot get out. Right? Because viscous forces are also very, very important in the mind. So the first rule, you learn already about scaling. Those forces that scale with the lowest power of the dimension becomes dominant. So you can always think about the beaker, right? If I pour water on your head, it will come easily out. But if I put the same amount of water in a capillary, it does not come out. So think about it that way. Summarizing a little bit here about this slide, one linear extrapolation of length comes relatively easy to us. We are very quickly at a loss when considering the implications that shrinking of length has on surface area to volume. Okay. So if you're just talking about we go from here to here, in length is easy. But when we start thinking about the consequences it has on surface to volume and on the relative strength of external forces, very quickly our intuition is not that forceful anymore. We can't get it. We don't easily understand it. Uh, so actuate to make this one more difficult to predict. Capillary tubes, weight scales as L to the third, and surface stage scales as L to the one. And so that force becomes more important. So Let's do the Gulliver question now. So, if Gulliver was 12 times as tall as the Lilliputians, how much should they feed him? And so, how much should the small people feed uh, Gulliver? You think it would be 12 times their own food ration? So, hint, a person food, uh, food needs are related to their mass. That makes sense, right? Volume, which depends on the cube of the linear dimension, like the same as there. So if LG and VG denote Gulliver's linear and volume dimension, and LL and VL is denotes the same for the Lilliputians, uh, and Gulliver is 12 times taller than them, you can then very quickly figure out that, look, they need to feed them not 12 times more, but 1,728 times more. So Gulliver needs to be fed 1,728 times the amount of food each day that the little Christians use themselves. So that explains why Gulliver was driven out, right? He said, hey, you gotta eat too much. I'm gonna get rid of you. Uh, this is not so easy to predict, right, from your micro-intuition. 
you wouldn't immediately have set that. You might have set all ten times more or something, right? But you wouldn't have set 1,728 times. That's why we will need some math to guide us to better insight. Math along this line, but hopefully a little bit more sophisticated than that. So the effect, we're still not talking about this micro intuition. The effect of downscaling, especially in another domain, is actually not very well known. Uh, if some of you will continue in the field of nanotechnology, I'm sure you will have important contributions and papers in figuring out what is the scaling law, let's say, of a fluid in a nanochannel. We can we know how a liquid behaves in a millimeter tube, right? Or in a centimeter tube. But even in a micro dimension, we already kind of uh, does it behave normal. Right? And definitely in a nano domain, it does not behave what we call as normal. So for example, scaling shows that NEMS devices feature fundamental frequencies looking at that. You can actually have microwave regime devices. They can vibrate so fast that they're in a microwave regime. You can measure active masses in the femtogram range. You can have mechanical quality factors or cues in tens of thousands. And you can have force sensitivities in the upper Newton level. So you can measure upper Newtons. What is upper? Thank you, Dan. Minus? No. 18. Mass sensitivities at the level of individual atoms and heat capacities far beyond the octo. Have you heard about the octo calories? I must admit, I forgot also what the octo is. Can you check what the octo is? Maybe 20 to, 10 to the minus 24 or something? I don't know. What is it? The octo. Nowadays, uh, Google Powers of Ten, you'll actually see all type of movies and nice illustrations of uh, what happens if you, for example, consider the Earth uh, at different length scales in, in steps of ten. Maybe first you see city, then you see a house, then you see a person, then you see a cell, then you see an atom, etc. You can find many examples, and that's just one naive example of it right there. So we will now introduce a more rigid mathematical formulation for scaling of a system. And we talked mostly about intuition, told you, eh, maybe not so predictable, not so solid. Uh, our aim is to develop a systematic approach about the likely behavior of downside systems so we do not need to rely on micro intuition alone. Uh, this table here on the right shows actually a whole bunch of activated principles here on the left, and then it shows the force, displacement, etc. And these are real life examples. The hope is that by studying this mathematical approach to scaling, we can actually predict some of that rather than having to build them and check. So we can model it up front. We don't need to make them all. We can do some more clever experiments. So we're going to start this simple, uh, this mathematical introduction. We're going to start with surface to volume effects. Fractal dimension we can scrap, and we'll not cover that. That would get me too far. But people that have an interest in it, uh, they can read up uh, on, on the topic in volume three of my new book. So a few very simple, straightforward things. Surface scales as that's square. Volume as L to the third, and now surface to volume will be 2 over 3, right? Or surface is V to the power 2 over 3. 
two three is point six seven, right? So in the last equation here, where we say surface scales as v to the power two of three, what does that mean say? It says that as the volume of a body is increased, its surface does not increase in the same proportion, but only in proportion to the two thirds power of the volume. What does it really say? It says that if you make things smaller, it has, relatively speaking, more surface. And so, a very uh, nice example to lock that in your memory that I want to tell you about to illustrate that point uh, is an example from the zoo. If you go to the zoo and you see large animals like an elephant, uh, you will not see him eat too often. Right? He eats maybe once a day, but he eats a lot. Uh, have you ever seen a chipmunk? It's a very small animal. It's always eating, right? Small animal, always eating. A big animal doesn't eat that much. Why is that? A small animal loses its energy over its surface, and a small animal has more surface to volume than a large animal. So in other words, for a small animal to keep its temperature, because we talk about warm-blooded animals, to keep the body temperature constant, it needs to keep on eating. Right? A large, like an elephant, does not lose its energy so fast, because relatively speaking, it has less surface. Nice, huh? That is why, by the way, in nature, you will not find warm-blooded animals below a certain size. Yeah? Because they could not survive. They would have to eat all the time yeah? to keep the body temperature up. So it's such a nice illustration of this phenomenon, right? Of the surface to volume effect. We can also write an equation, of course, as S, and bring in a proportionality constant, V to the power of 0.67, right? 2 over 3. Or, that S over V is K V 0.67 divided by V, or S over V comes again constant, same constant, V to the power of minus 0.33. That's just some simple manipulation. What does the latter expression say? It repeats another very well known fact. Smaller bodies have relatively to their volume larger surface areas than larger bodies of the same shape. And so I gave you this important example of uh, an animal size right, that <laughs> confirms that. So you will never forget now, right, why small animals keep on eating and large animals don't. But you know in your experimental practice actually in the lab, you will encounter issues with this. I'll give you an example. Who has done PCR in this lab? In this life, I should say. PCR. Who knows what PCR is? Can you raise your hand? PCR. Who knows? Whole chain reaction. Who has done this in the lab? Who, who has performed PCR in the lab? You have, yeah? And so in PCR, you have a small amount of liquid, right? That you will heat and cool, heat and cool. What do you do with that heat and small volume of liquid? You put some oil over it, right? Yeah? You put some oil over it. Why do you do that? So if you have that little bit of liquid and you heat and cool, you will put some oil, a drop of oil over the liquid. Do of evaporation. <laughs> and so the smaller the liquid volume, the faster it will evaporate, right? So what can you do against that? Say, I want you to make a micro droplet based PCR. What will be the problem? Big problem will be evaporation, right? By the time you look at it, your drop is gone. <laughs> because surface to volume, it becomes so big, right? And so that thing, it evaporates from its surface, right? And so, for example, if you do protein printing or DNA printing, and your nozzle is too far from the surface, you might not ever hit the surface because it will be evaporated before it hits the surface. You as engineers, how could you solve some such problems? Give me some ideas. How could you solve this? What would you do? Yeah. 
So you would try to increase the vapor pressure, right? So you would add oil then, that we we're talking about the PCR. Right? Also, when you make a vessel, would you make it high and sh let me draw it. In the micro domain, which one do you prefer? This one or this one? This one, right? Because this one will be evaporated in no time. This one, you can keep your liquid for a long time. Right? Because there's little surface. And so there's a whole bunch of tricks like that that when you go to the micro and nano domain, you have to think about. Right? So again, this is related to surface to volume. Well, this is so simple, but we go over it anyway. When it comes to length, every length in the